Ian, thank you very much for your time. Welcome to Talking Pest Management. You're welcome, Daniel. Good to speak to you. <laughs> Ian, uh, we just briefly discussed you are the head of BPCA in the UK, so the main association in Great Britain, and you're taking care of all the pest managers around the country and also beyond uh, through your uh, work at SEPA. How did, how did COVID hit you? How did you communicate and, and what changed? Yeah, COVID meant it, not something that we've lived through before. So it was all new. It was new to our members. It was new to us as a trade association. Equally, it was new to SEPA as a European association. And I think to start with, um, it, was, it was a bit shell-shocked. Um, we, we knew it was coming. And we've known since probably January that it was heading in our direction. But did we do enough to get ready? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so, when, particularly when UK went into lockdown and the week preceding that, um, as a trade association, our key priority was to help our members mm -hmm. do what they needed to do. Um, the biggest challenge here in the UK was the fact that pest control wasn't recognised as a key worker. Um, yeah. And as we went into lockdown, that could have had, and may still have, um, severe implications. Um, yeah. So going into lockdown, it was uh, absolutely critical that we got both the UK government and the devolved governments um, to change their perception of pest management. Um, so we went into fairly um, high level um, activity just to get key worker status um, resolved here in the UK. Fortunately, um, pest controllers could still go about their business because you cannot do pest control from home. You can do remote monitoring from home, but you can't actually go out and do pest control from yeah. home. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, where businesses were still open and operating, then our members could go out and continue. Um, and so the first thing we did was really just to give them a decision tree mm -hmm. to help them decide, is this a work something that I should be doing? How do I balance the risk between what pest problem is and my own safety? Yes. And therefore, um, is, it, is it a piece of work that is essential? And how do I do it um, safely for myself and safely for any other human beings that I may come in contact with while I have to do that piece of work? Mm -hmm. Um, so really helping our members dis decide which work they can do if the decision is theirs. Um, where the decision isn't theirs, because a lot of pubs, restaurants said, no, we're closed, we're, we're stopping your contract. Mm. Um, really helping our members persuade their clients that actually stopping their contract perhaps wasn't the wisest thing to do because mm. pests don't understand that we're amidst a pandemic and um, they will continue going about their business. Um, <laughs> and the last thing we wanted was for our members' clients to reopen with a major uh, infestation or with major damage. Mm. So really producing material and um, things that would help our members help their clients make the right decisions in these fairly unprecedented times. So um, the, as I say, it was all new, new ground for us. We uh, had to deal with anything like this before and neither had our members. Um, mm -hmm. But what was clear, was after a fairly initial shock uh, and some members thinking, oh, I can't do my, the business as I normally would, uh, a lot of them then realising actually they can go about their business. Um, and with the survey that we did recently, we had over 900 respondents, so a fairly significant group of respondents, and 85% of our members are still going about their business in one way or another. Wow. Uh, and that's, that's great. Um, yeah. they, the business has been affected, but they're still doing a level of business. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, I've, I've got to say, while the UK government has talked about a lot of support being put in place for businesses to keep going, so grants and loans, etc., actually accessing cash. Yeah, it wasn't that easy or quick to, to access, right? Yeah, and it's the time scale for some of these very, very great, good supportive projects. It's the time scale of getting them into place. Hmm. Uh, as we know, cash is king. Uh, uh, and so uh, a lot of businesses were running out of cash very quickly. Yeah. So they, while the members were still going about their business, their revenue was diminished um, and government support just, just wasn't there. It's being talked about, but it wasn't there. Um, so we did. We've done some things to help our members. We've we've put a, a delay in calling direct debits. This, should be, this week we should have called quarterly direct debits of our members. We pushed that back to July, mm -hmm. uh, just to give them a, a little bit of cash in their bank account to help them. Um, but thankfully, as I say, eighty five percent of them still still operating. Uh, those that have stopped operating, half of those decided to stop for their own personal health reasons. They okay. were the fear of their own personal health. That, so that the UK, you're saying the percentage of people that are still working is way higher, probably, like probably around the 95-ish. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Wow. Um, so the concerns for personal health, but overall, the, the membership are absolutely optimistic about the future. And over 80% of them saying life will return to some degree of normality after this pandemic. So a high level of, of optimism, but they are struggling. They're struggling financially. Yes. And it, it, one of the most interesting figures that came out of that survey was that 44% of the respondents said that they were, the pandemic was affecting their mental health. Yes, wow. 44%. That's an astonishing figure. Even, you know what it's like, we don't often like to speak about these things, do we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think uh, in 2020, mental health is so prominent as it never was before. I think mental, mental health is actually a topic in our also Western world uh, where um, luckily we have a great health and uh, an insurance system uh, supporting our people. Um, I think mental health during these, you know, quite luxurious times, if you compare it to, I don't know, Ethiopia or something, yeah. is uh, a concern. And I think for uh, runners of businesses with such amounts of pressure, and then also, you know, the, the unknown um, variables that the pandemic drives towards them and their business and their staff and their team and their clients could lead to a point where definitely, uh, um, you know, there will be some mental, I don't know, not breakdowns, but at least it's, it's, challenging for the mental health situation yeah of a person ceo and then the business and so forth so a super interesting figure yeah how do you how, how can we change that i mean how can we give our past managers our, the companies more security how can we how are you trying to um act uh, responsibly so uh we can give them more security yeah and i mean a, a lot of the things we have been doing to 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 help them get that recognition that they are a key worker, they are important, the, the work that they're doing has got worth and value to society. I think that's been an important step. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that recognition in the UK, uh, recognition in Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland did a slightly different thing where, where we are more or less recognised. We've just got mm -hmm. Wales to sort out now. Um, <laughs> But that, that recognition, I think, has helped people get that sense of worth. Nice. Um, absolutely. They are worried about their staff, if they've got staff. They're worried about themselves, their health, um, their own families. And yes, they're worried about the resilience of their business because a lot of them didn't have any contingency plans in place for this happening. Um, so doing what we've done as a trade association and giving them some of the support, giving them some of the tools, even just giving them somebody to speak to. Um, and our technical team have been busier than ever, just mm -hmm. dealing with queries around 
whether they should be doing jobs or not and just having somebody to to speak to i think has been helpful for them um but it is it's an extremely difficult time for people sure yeah but i'm sure also with the with the decision tree that you that you provided to your members uh, i think you know um looking at uh, for us um this is very bird's eye what we're speaking today is the macro perspective of course you as the head of the bpca uh, so the uk association and, and part of sepa and myself interviewing people from all around the world it's a very macro point of view um but in the end having these you know for people and and, and, and companies having these decision trees is a very uh, thing that you can actually grab and, and helps you so in the, in the micro um, that is hopefully, hopefully uh, driving some impact and giving some stability to people, um, at least in my eyes. So at least for me, I can uh, also with all the interviews and all the um, uh, non-recorded interviews or discussions with peers that I have, I can really say, and I want to um, uh, say that out, can't uh, say that out uh, loud enough, uh, that you and the BPAs, BPCA did some excellent work there. Work there. Um, I personally am in your newsletter. I see that you're sending out webinars and videos to the members, uh, emails with all sorts of documents and, and download links. So having somebody like your association in place in the UK, I think everybody can be really proud uh, for, um, in comparison to other countries that barely have an association. And I think uh, that alone shows again, as you stood together and fought for recognition as key workers, what can be achieved with a, with a strong team entity uh, that I think you form excellently in the UK. So I heard a lot of people applaud you and you guys. So I want to take the time right now and also th say thank you as the UK is, uh, um, is one of the important marketplaces for pest management in the world with a great ecosystem uh, and, and businesses that are protected by pest managers. And I think we all know how important pest management is, is why we're doing this interview right here. So uh, yeah, Ian, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate the feedback, and I know the team will appreciate it as well. And um, I was on a global coalition call yesterday, so with the other associations across America, Latin America, Asia, etc., um, and just um, agreeing there that as an association, as associations, we will set up a sharing portal. Oh, so good. Some of the uh, initiatives that we've done, initiatives that have been undertaken in other countries can be shared more widely, uh, especially where there's countries with small associations or associations that don't have the infrastructure uh, or the people to actually create some of the tools and some of the resources that yeah. we've been able to create. So rather than them starting from scratch, yeah. uh, Let's at least give them yeah. insight into what we've done and they can copy and paste or it's better than starting with a, a blank page. So uh, yeah. we're a bit late in getting that out there, but we'll get that pulled together as a global coalition. And similarly, at European level, SEPA with the, the knowledge hub that it's, yeah. it's developed has been helpful. And again, this, this, there's no better time than to share the resources and to share the knowledge mm. um, and it's it's um, yeah I mean there's no doubt some of our stuff is is for our members and it, mm. and we create it for our members um, but other stuff it's there for anyone and everyone yeah. to access and to use sometimes these times help us obviously to digitize quicker and use you know remote tools like zoom or other video technologies or working methods quickly and more quickly um, than we planned or intended to, especially in pest management, which is still a very, you know, hands-on, roll up your sleeves uh, a job. Um, you just yourself said uh, remote monitoring is fine, but you can't do uh, pest control and management uh, from home. I thought it was really interesting of, because it's so obvious. Uh, uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, about um, what you think, uh, uh, you know, the workers need to be supported to go out there. And uh, also, I would like your two cents on um, how you think pest management could change or is it at all going to change post-COVID? Okay, let, let me speak briefly about the digital world, because there's no doubt that the pandemic has accelerated us into that world. And uh, I mean, we had over the course of the last year introduced a lot of webinars um, that was great. Um, but our, our physical events had to stop. Um, so a few weeks ago, we ran our first digital forum, 
um, that members and non-members can attend a half-day event with various speakers. We had over 500 registrations. Really? That event. Over 400 people stuck with it for the whole of the three-hour event. Um, so we've got another of those planned for the 20th of May. Um, and I'm fairly sure that uh, as half-day events, they will continue after the pandemic. So um, that, that's been great. Um, we've, we've opened up a, a significant range of CPD resources for our members, mm -hmm. most of which are free. Um, and we're, we're daily adding to that digital resource. Uh, because whether you're still working or not working, it's important that your professional development continues. Um, and so to give, give our members access to digital resources at this time is, is the obvious thing to do. Um, we're, we're developing some, some more digital learning. Um, and that will become available over the next few weeks as well. So Love it. Um, really accelerating that, that digital content, and that's important. Mm -hmm. As far as the, uh, and so as a trade association, as a, like every other membership organization, we've had to change gear. Mm -hmm. We've had to do things differently. We've had to focus on things that perhaps we wouldn't have necessarily focused on. And I think the same is true in, in, in pest management. Um, I think if we come out of this doing everything that we did as we came into this, then I think we've missed an opportunity. <laughs> we did, surely. Uh, and whatever the, the, the new future looks like, I think there will be significant changes. I think people will have found new and innovative ways of doing things. They will have spent time researching methods like remote monitoring and and putting in uh, more, techni more yeah, technological solutions that they may not have considered before yep. um, mm -hmm. and so I, I'm hoping that they despite the fact they are struggling financially in some cases uh, I hope that they're still able to invest in looking at new ways of doing things um, and, and I mean, digital monitoring is a, a great asset um, and, and fits nicely in, in an IPM approach to, to pest management. Mm. Uh, but many haven't tried it. And as you know, the cost has come down yeah. significantly over time. It did, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there will be new ways of people finding new ways of doing things by necessity. Necessity is the mother of invention, and I'm sure that that's been the case throughout this pandemic. So I'm confident that things will be different as we come out of it. Different in a way of better, right? Uh, I totally yeah. agree. Um, so what, despite or um, let's say, uh, um, yeah, despite all the digitization that is now taking place because of COVID, do you think uh, there is more uh, structural changes in our industry that's going to stick around? I mean, the world post-COVID, um, um, companies may be getting more efficient or they are getting more, I don't know, uh, trying out more innovative means of pest control. Is sustainability at all changing? Is, is that a thing that people are looking more towards, um, towards finding out more innovative uh, sustainability resources for their treatment? I think it's maybe too early to tell just how significant a change there, there may be in sustainability. Um, but as I say, the, there's no doubt that the pest control sector is having to do things differently yeah. and are taking the time to introduce new approaches. I mean, some of the big companies have got the research and innovation teams that, that can introduce new ways of, of doing things. So providing products to their clients that they can then provide remote um, advice for their clients to use their products and to place them well, place them right, and to, to manage it, which um, comes in for some criticism because that means a technician doesn't have to be on site. Well, mm -hmm. no, but that's the whole point. That's why it's being done at the moment so that we reduce the risk 
of a technician having be on being be having to be on site. Um, and so, as I say, they they are ha they are particularly the larger organisations have got the wherewithal to bring about fairly significant change in the way they do things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that will trickle down through the whole sector. I mean, the sector's predominantly micro businesses. Yes, sure. They don't, they have, they sure. don't have their own research and development departments Absolutely. other than themselves. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's too early to hear uh, just how much innovation, how much different approaches are being taken at that level. We're seeing it with the big boys. We are. But it's too early just to, to get much data back on what's different across the wider sector. Exactly, across the water sector. That will be really interesting to revisit maybe in a couple of months and a half a year from today. Absolutely. I, I really enjoyed the survey that you um, prominently quoted a couple of times. Are there any other findings from, from the survey that might be interesting to the broader audience? Yeah, as I say, 85% of member companies still still working, although uh, three quarters of our, our companies have had contracts cancelled. Mm. Um, they've, they've had their clients saying, no, we don't want you here. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a, an initial knee-jerk reaction, a lot of clubs and pubs and restaurants saying, just cancelling every service that they had. Um, anecdotally, we're finding that that's changing now. They've realised, they've maybe gone back into their pub or their restaurant and realised they've got a problem and wish they hadn't <laughs> cancelled that contract. Mm -hmm. So um, that there are early indications that, yeah. that um, things are shifting back again. So as I say, three quarters of, of our members had experience contracts being cancelled. Um, as I said, the, the biggest challenge is we've, we haven't lived through anything like this before in our lifetimes. So we have nothing to compare it against. But I think the fact that 80% of our members are remaining optimistic about the future. That's important. Mm -hmm. um, in pest management, allegedly the second oldest profession in the world. So um, it's been around for a long time and I'm sure it will continue to be around for a long time. Uh, but if if this pandemic can make make us do things slightly differently, slightly more effectively, with greater concern for the world around us, then that's no bad thing. That was something I would like to quote you uh, on. Uh, I think a very well put uh, a sentence at, at, at the very end of the interview, Ian. Um, I think it, this pandemic has the chance and we as a sector, the opportunity to use it to improve um, the part of, of course, the reputation and the, the perception of our industry as a sector, um, because I am too, Uh, and this is the mission of this video interview series, is uh, to elevate past managers uh, towards, you know, more of the, you know, not bait box checkers, but uh, indeed to professionals um, that are using all innovation uh, technologies for communication, task management, uh, remote monitoring, uh, preventive measurements, IPM, etc., to elevate us from bait box checkers, uh, which I think uh, we all don't deserve to be called that. And um, this is my main point, really looking at what can be done and bringing it to the wider public that people get informed about what innovative uh, associations like yourself are doing. Uh, E-learning, uh, just to sum up a few e-learning webinars, newsletters, uh, download hubs, information hubs, then, then you know, the, the trees to work, you know, the information trees for, for soul workers, etc. This is really something that I think means a lot and improves quality of our industry. And um, I would agree to, you know, pest management is probably going to stick around a bit. In the end, we're called pest management because there once has been a pest. Uh, and, uh, you know, currently we are talking about a virus that is a global pandemic. So um, uh, viruses and bacteria also spread by pests, which are rats, birds, insects, cockroaches, etc. So I think the importance of what we do, also assignment of key workers. Thank you very much for uh, uh, supporting that. Um, the importance of what we do is just ever going to grow as we speak. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. And I really want to say, uh, you know, my, 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 my 
blessings to all of the people out there performing pest control still and their families. Hopefully they're going to stay safe and the 15% um, uh, that are not working currently uh, are returning to work fairly quickly. And I also hope that the mental health um, issues that should be, you know, not, not should be ignored um, uh, being more addressed and hopefully more securities given towards um, pest managers through everything you do. Uh, super, Daniel. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, and thanks, thanks for taking the initiative to give us some airtime. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I hope we're going to revisit that topic very soon. So, uh, probably looking at having you very shortly in the next couple of months again. Thank you, Ian. Super. Thanks, Daniel.